Hi everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium stream. My name is Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is a familiar face to those who have been here before, but I will still let him introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is Eli, I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So tonight, Eli is going to be telling us all about how we know things that we probably take for granted as just common knowledge, like the distance to the sun, the speed of light, that sort of things, because, you know, people did have to figure that out. And so he's going to share with us how early uh, scientists were able to figure these things out that we assume I just take as common knowledge now. So um, I will turn it over to Eli. If you do have any questions throughout the show, you can leave them down in the comments. I'll be keeping an eye on those and we'll let Eli know when any questions pop up and then we'll also take time at the end as well. Uh, so I will stop my spiel. Eli, it is on to you. Sweet. I'm going to share my screen. Will you tell me if it looks all right? Yep. Looks good. Got, uh, coming across well. Okay, cool. So um, the first thing I wanted to do when I made this show was kind of just do a quick run through of um, just the math that is relevant um, in this show. We're not going to be doing any math and I will try to avoid it as much as possible, but just to have an idea of how some of these things were accomplished, I think it's important to understand how these astronomers used triangles. Um, so this diagram of a triangle right here, um, the angle that is marked with the uh, Greek letter theta at the bottom left of the triangle, um, that's the angle that we're, that's, that's our reference angle. Um, and so there are some functions, they're called trigonometric functions um, that you can use to um, analyze the triangle or learn things about it. Um, for example, um, the sine of that angle is equal to the opposite side O divided by the hypotenuse, which is also labeled. Um, cosine of that angle, which just spits out a number, is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse side. Um, and then the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. Um, so these are, it's just some functions um, that were figured out um, that become really, really useful um, when uh, solving triangles, which is kind of the way that all of these things were done. Um, uh, this, trigonometry was pretty uh, paramount to uh, early astronomical discovery and astronomical discovery today. Um, so um, the first thing I wanna talk about is how did we learn um, the size of the earth? Um, the size of the earth is um, very well known nowadays uh, due to the advent of space telescopes um, and their ability to take images of the earth itself. But previous to this, um, it took some very, very, very clever experimentation around 250 BC by a Greek astronomer and scientist named Aristosthenes to uh, get a good idea of just how big the uh, pale blue dot is. Um, he knew that on the day of the summer solstice, the sun cast no shadow at noon in the city of Syene, which means it lies directly on the Tropic of Cancer. Um, he wanted to see if the same could be observed in Alexandria, a city that is quite some distance away from Syene. So he traveled to Alexandria and put a post in the ground to see if a shadow was cast. Um, to surprise, a shadow did um, appear, and it was measured to be about 7.2 degrees. Um, so through some trigonometric rules and the assumption that the Earth is perfectly spherical, which it is not, but it's pretty darn close, um, Aristosthenes realized that Syene and Alexandria are 7.2 degrees apart on the circumference of the Earth. Um, that's about 1 50th of the uh, circumference. Um, so that means that uh, the distance from Syene to Alexandria is about 1 50th of the circumference of the Earth. He then, and this is true, hired a man to walk that distance and measure how far it is as he walked it, and it ends up being 800 kilometers. Um, so multiplying 800 kilometers by 50, he found that the circumference of the Earth is about 80,000 kilometers, um, which is just under a percent off from the real value of 80,060 kilometers. So that's, that's really close. That's super impressive to me. Um, the thing that's most impressive to me through that is the accuracy of the person who walked it and measured it. Um, that's kind of astonishing to me that they got that close. So next, I also how do we know the size of the moon? Oh, sorry. I was going to yeah, say, what right. I also think is funny is at the time, people didn't actually trust his calculation. Yeah, no. Because Aristotle had given a different amount, a different size, and everyone trusted Aristotle, even though he was like super off. 
yeah. his measurement was like half the actual size of what the earth is so it wasn't until like much later that we realized how good of a measurement aristophanes took yeah that, that poor guy that had to walk that whole oh i know oh, um <laughs> that's so terrible um the uh, next groundbreaking measurement was made by Aristarchus of Samos um, at around the same time, actually. Um, and knowing the size of the Earth was a very invaluable tool um, in calculating other things, as it gave astronomers a reference point for making some of these observations. Um, Aristarchus correctly reasoned that a lunar eclipse was a result of the Earth casting a shadow onto the moon, but incorrectly reasoned that the sun's light reaches the Earth in perfectly parallel lines, which is what you would see in the top diagram. Um, that's what he figured would happen, um, but that's not what actually happens. Um, the shadow cast by the Earth is not exactly the size of the Earth once it gets to where the moon orbits. Um, but uh, that's, that's where that was a source of a little inaccuracy. Um, but what he did um, is he for timed the uh, period in which the moon was within Earth's shadow, which turned out to be about 2.6 hours. Um, and then he timed the period it took for the moon to travel one of its own diameters in the sky, which came out to be roughly an hour. Um, he then reasoned that since it took the moon 2.6 times longer to travel the size of the Earth than itself, the Earth must be 2.6 times bigger than the moon. And he then found that the diameter of the moon should be about 38% of the Earth, when in reality, it's about 30. Um, this is remarkably close um, for having so little at his disposal, which is kind of the case for all of these things. Um, and uh, this discovery was incredibly useful in learning about the size and distance to other objects in the solar system. Um, so we kind of have a springboard now um, to be able to measure other things. And even though he was a couple percent off, it's still, I mean, remarkable to think that just by looking up at the moon, you could figure out how big it is compared to how big the Earth is. Um, so now we're going to talk about finding distance to the moon, which is much harder. Um, after Aristarchus discovered the size of the moon, Hipparchus used this as a stepping stone towards discovering the distance to the moon from the Earth, um, which is also very important. Um, this is, uh, like I said, probably the most mathematically intensive and impressive calculation, and it's, I have to like remind myself constantly that this was done over 2,000 years ago. It kind of um, embarrasses me that, you know, I get tripped up on homework and these people were doing, you know, finding the uh, distance to the moon. Um, to find the distance, um, Hipparchus realized that as you move across the surface of the Earth, the apparent position of the moon in the sky changes relative to the stars behind it. Um, this is extremely useful in finding this distance, as you are something called the parallax method. Um, and in this method, you create an imaginary triangle and solve it for the distance. So this is where the triangles come in. Can I so, real um, quick? Two apparent positions. Yeah. Um, I just want to, I find it's useful uh, to f it, tell everyone about the, the thumb method to kind of see this for themselves. Um, so you can see this oh, yeah, yeah. parallax shift. If you hold your thumb up in front of your face and you close your right eye and open your left eye uh, and then switch eyes. So close your left eye and open your right eye. And if you switch back and forth, you'll see your thumb appears to shift back and forth, even though it's not moving. And that's because you're looking through different eyes, which is basically simulating looking from different locations. And so the same things happen here on the earth. If we move across the earth, things in the sky will appear to shift position because our observing location has changed. So just just wanted to, to clarify or to give that example because I think it helps um, understand and see what this parallax is that we're talking about. Sorry, go ahead, Eli. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, with the two apparent positions of the stars, just like the two apparent positions of your thumb um, in the example Jessica gave, um, you can draw a triangle connecting two different places on the Earth's surface and the moon and the uh, stars behind them. Um, you can find uh, one angle of the triangle, which is really all you need to solve it, by measuring the distance between the stars in the sky. Um, Hipparchus found that angle to be about 0.3 degrees. Um, he also knew the distance between Celsius in the United Kingdom and Athens, Greece, which are the locations um, from which he looked at the star relative to the moon. Um, by doing some trigonometry and solving that triangle, he found the distance to the moon within 17% uh, of the actual value. Again, it's not super precise, but I mean, still amazing for the time. Um, so, I mean, just by changing the position of a star behind the moon, 
he was able to figure out how far away the moon is just by looking at it from different places on Earth. Um, and uh, this method uh, lives on uh, very famously, um, as stellar parallax is the method used most um, often to find the distance to faraway stars. Um, rather than the moon being the target in the diagram above, they replace it with the star. And um, since the distances are much larger on the scale, the two positions used to measure the change um, relative to the background are at opposite ends of Earth's orbit around the sun, rather than two cities on the surface of the Earth. But the idea is the same, and it's used a lot today. All right, um, the distance to the sun. This one's also really cool to me. Um, so after this, uh, Aristarchus took the reins again. Um, they kind of like were handing it off to each other on who did what. Um, and uh, he used the distance to the moon to find the distance to the sun. Um, like all others before him, uh, he used trigonometry and triangle identity identities to his advantage um, and constructed a right triangle out of the sun earth moon system when the moon was in its last quarter phase. Um, he then had to estimate the angle between the moon and the sun in the sky with the naked eye, which he estimated to within three degrees of the accepted value, which is, again, amazing because he did it with his naked eye. Um, from here, um, he used the cosine function, um, arranged it to solve for the distance to the sun, and got an answer within 14% accuracy. So again, for naked eye astronomy, that is amazing. So just to give some context to what he did, um, remember earlier we were talking about the cosine is the um, adjacent over the hypotenuse. Um, the angle that we're using is 89.93, um, which is the accepted value for the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Um, so that would translate to the cosine of 89.93 would be equal to the distance to the Moon over the distance to the Sun. And rearranging that, you can solve the distance to the Sun is equal to the distance to the Moon over cosine of 89.93. And that gives you the distance. Um, okay, and now, um, this is another really remarkable one, um, is uh, how big is the sun? Um, this discovery um, comes about only because we live in perfect alignment, such that when the moon passes between us and the sun, it blocks the sun almost perfectly. If the earth were any closer or further from the moon or sun, this method would not work, and it would have been way harder to solve this problem. Um, luckily for us, however, um, the alignment is just right. And after finding the distance to the sun, Aristarchus of Samos thought that he could use this perfect alignment to his advantage. He drew a diagram, a diagram, not unlike the one seen in the slide in the top right, and realized that the moon and the sun have the same angular size in the sky, um, which just means they take up the same amount of space when you're looking into the sky. Um, and because of this, uh, Aristarchus found that we could apply some rules we know to be true about similar triangles and discovered that the size of the sun could be found through the ratio shown below the diagram. So the size of the sun divided by the size of the moon would be equal to the distance to the sun divided by the distance to the moon. Um, in solving for the size of the sun, Aristarchus found that the sun is much larger than the earth, which we know now to be true. Um, and while his estimate was off by, uh, you know, almost significant amount um, due to the errors um, propagating from the previous measurements. He still found a reasonable estimate for the size of the uh, Earth, Moon, Sun system. And these discoveries led to some pretty uh, amazing and important theories um, about space, um, namely the fact that the Earth orbits the Sun. Um, this next discovery is my favorite. I wrote a paper on it for one of my physics classes, um, and it was a lot of fun to learn about it. Um, and uh, the coolest thing about it is that it happened pretty much on accident, um, yet it's one of the most important numbers in physics. Um, some 1500 years after the time of Aristarchus and Hipparchus, the first attempt to prove that light travels at a finite speed was by Galileo Galilei. Um, and it was not the most genius, but I think he tried really hard. Um, it consisted of two men with lanterns um, standing on hilltops separated by less than a mile. Um, and uh, they would open the lantern, and then the person on the other side of the hilltop would open their lantern once they saw the lantern open. You can probably guess how that worked. Light travels a little fast for that experiment. Um, and uh, it was apparent that a new method was needed to prove the idea that light didn't travel instantaneously. Um, Ole Romer uh, was not attempting to prove this when he was measuring the time it took for Jupiter's moon Io to orbit the planet one time, but he stumbled upon it by accident. Um, he noticed that when the Earth was at its farthest distance from Jupiter, um, labeled in the picture there, um, the orbit of Io appeared to be about 11 minutes longer than the average orbital period. And when Earth was at its, when at its closest distance, it was about 11 minutes shorter. 
he reasoned that this was due to the fact that the light coming from Io was traveling at a finite speed, and the discrepancies were due to the travel time it took for the light to reach Earth at um, these points. Um, from here, famous astronomer Christian Huygens uh, measured the speed of light and found it within 70% accuracy. Um, again, not extremely precise, but um, very impressive given the technology at the time. Um, nevertheless, uh, the speed was confirmed with more accuracy um, about 50 years later um, by astronomer James Bradley um, using stellar aberration. Um, so yeah, the, just basically what it boiled down to is um, the distance between the Earth when it's labeled at closest distance and Earth when it's labeled at farthest distance in that diagram um, translated to 11 minutes more travel time for light. So you just take that distance, which was known at the time, um, or you know, almost known, um, and uh, you take the distance from the Earth to the Sun, multiply it by two, um, and that is how far the light would travel in 11 minutes. Um, so you can figure it out from there, and that's pretty amazing to me. Um, I thought this one was really interesting. Um, okay, uh, how do we know the distance to nearby stars? Um, remember how Hipparchus used the uh, parallax method to find the distance to the moon, um, where he watched how the position of the moon changed relative to the stars behind him, so, or behind it, so he could measure the angle, and then made a triangle and solved it. Um, like I said, this method um, is used to find the distance um, to stars uh, to this day. Um, and it's called stellar parallax um, when used for stars. Um, and scientists and astronomers adopted Hipparchus's method by observing how nearby stars appear to move relative to the stars behind them during Earth's orbit around the sun. Um, after six months, the star's position appears to have changed significantly. Um, and uh, that is because the sun has moved to the other side, or the Earth has moved to be on the other side of the sun at that point. So your background image has shifted. Um, and uh, you can measure that change, the, which is called the parallax angle. And once you know that angle, you can find the distance to the star by creating a triangle. Um, so just some context to what I was talking about earlier with the Parkus's method being adopted. Um, how do we know how far away galaxies are? There are a bunch of ways to do this, um, but uh, I'm just gonna talk about one of them. Um, for distances uh, much larger than stars within our galaxies, um, for example, the distance um, with, between galaxies, parallax doesn't work um, as the parallax angle by the Earth orbiting the sun is way too small to be measured. Um, instead, astronomers rely on things called standard candles. Um, standard candles are any stars um, or events that have a known brightness and can be identified from far away. Um, if astronomers know how bright the object actually was, so for example, we know how bright this type of supernova is. If we see something that, that's type of that looks like that type of supernova, we know how bright it should be. Um, and if they know how bright the object should be, um, and then they measure how bright it is relative to us, um, we can figure out how far it is based on how much the brightness um, dropped off. Um, the brightness of something decreases um, with something called the inverse square law. So basically, um, if you move twice as far away from something, um, the light source will be one fourth as bright. So if I'm a foot away from my, you know, a, lant a, a lantern and it's, you know, X brightness and I move another foot away, so I'm twice as far away from it, it will be one fourth the brightness it was when I was a foot closer. Um, so that's just a given relationship and it's really useful um, in using these standard candles. Um, and the last one, um, I hope this video works. Um, how do we know where black holes are? This one's really cool too. Um, something often glossed over when talking about black holes is how we detect them. And it's super, super interesting. Um, if you think about it, a black hole is fundamentally really, really hard to detect um, as it gives us no light to see it or identify it. Um, this means um, we have to identify them with context clues. Um, black holes are commonly found by observing the things around them with other stars. Um, when we watch this video, it appears that these stars are orbiting an invisible center of mass or some invisible thing, um, and a strong one at that. Um, in a period of 10 years, it pulled multiple stars around it with pretty extreme ferocity. Um, there's only one thing we know um, that could do that, and in this case, it is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, which is called Sagittarius A star. Um, its extreme gravitational influence is pulling these stars around it in like really, really elliptical orbits, and through this footage, scientists were able to infer the existence of black holes. So Jessica, will you tell me if this works well? Yeah, that's working. Okay, cool. So where the uh, yellow cross is, you can see that these stars appear to be orbiting some invisible thing. Um, and it's gonna zoom in here. And it, whatever that invisible thing is, it's pulling those stars pretty hard. I'll play it one more time. 
especially that one. So yeah, um, when you see something like that, when you see a bunch of stars orbiting something that appears to be invisible, you can um, infer that that is a black hole. And uh, that is all I have. I have been muted on the stream. Um, <laughs> uh, if you have any questions for me or Eli, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, and what I'm saying is I very much agree uh, with you, Eli. That is so impressive what they were able to do. And this is even like we have to remember this is before things like calculators. So oh, yeah. we, we see something like figuring out the cosine and we just plug it in a calculator, but yeah. they, they didn't have that. I still don't know how that stuff works. I'm, I'm a junior physics student. I still don't. It involved lots of tables, lots yeah, of tables of data that you had to reference, mm -hmm. but it's just, and the, the innovativeness of having to figure out how to determine this stuff. Like right. it's just, yeah, it's, the, it's the thought really experiments impressive. or like the, the, the spatial knowledge was, I mean, so impressive. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. Um, that's why I don't like it when people like try and talk about, oh, early cultures couldn't build things this impressive. Like yeah, um, no. they were brilliant. Yeah. But, um, all right. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions come in yet. Um, so let me tell you guys what is going to be coming up over the next week. So, um, next week is, is the first week of February already. I feel like I say that every month, but I'm surprised when the next month is here, but it's just going by very quickly. Um, so since it is the first week of February, we will be doing our beginning, beginning of the month shows with what's up February edition on Wednesday and our February constellation story time on Saturday. Uh, and so you can join us to learn what you can find in the sky, what astronomical events are going on, uh, the constellations that you can see, planets that you can see, all of that, so that you can kind of be up to date for what February holds for you, at least in the night sky. Um, and then a few other things. We're going to have some special shows coming up this month um, that will be announced pretty soon. I will... I would think. Um, so of course we have Valentine's Day coming up and we want to do a special show for that. Uh, and then we also have the landing of the Perseverance Rover on Mars happening in a few weeks and we will be dedicating a show to that as well. Um, so some really cool things coming up. Um, let's see, we just got a comment. This really blew our minds. Never thought of geometry in this application. That what, it's, what was that? You you cut out for a second. What was the question? Oh, um, this really blew our minds. Never thought of geometry in this application. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, and that's, like he was saying, a lot of early astronomy was trig. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, thank you, Eli, for that awesome yeah. show, uh, cool. showing us how smart these early people were. Yep, just um, really amazing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, if you would like to have a private show with us, we are now offering private virtual shows, um, both for uh, just general events as well as virtual field trips. Uh, and so you can find information on that, including possible show topics, uh, price, uh, and a request form all on our website. 
Um, and lastly, if you love what we are doing and you'd like to support us, uh, we are still selling our Stellar Distancing t-shirts to help raise money since we have been closed for almost a year now. Um, and yeah, that's been, been tough. Um, but again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Eli. Uh, we hope to see all of you again at a future show. Uh, but until then, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we will see you again next time. Bye, everyone.